I want to um, share a story with you, and uh, and then I'd really love your Q and A afterwards because uh, you know spreading Christopher's message is what the last lap around my track is all about for me. Uh, you know, I did an interview with a, a wonderful guy named John St. Augustine, and he calls me, uh, you know, the unwilling prophet, you know, because um, this wasn't something um, that I chose. It was something that chose me. You know, I may not look like it, but I'm about to quote Haruki Murakami. I don't look like a guy that would quote Haruki Murakami. And the quote is, once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. That's what storms are all about. So this horrific tragedy that befell me in January 3rd, 2016, that befell all of us, um, is a bell that I can't unring. It can't be unrung. But wouldn't it be a shame to waste that and, 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 and not uh, share uh, the messages and the information that I've been given? So uh, quickly, uh, I will tell you one thing. There are no coincidences. You know, I know there. we have some uh, Australia uh, background here. I was doing a, a Zoom meeting a couple of years back in Western Ontario, and a woman from Australia happened to be on it. Her name's Lara Thompson. And I had mentioned my baby being at Boulder. And she said, you know, ask, ask, could you ask your son if he knew Connor? And Connor was her boy, who she had lost the previous December in a car wreck, and went off a cliff uh, in the, in the mountains of Colorado, and uh, and and it turns out that Chris William, my William, was very close friends with her boy, and was very shaken by that loss, and that connection of her and I. She's in helping parents heal. Um, she's come out for our January third ceremony. Um, you know, just amazing that I no longer believe in coincidences. I believe I don't believe talking to anybody here is a coincidence. So um, let's flash back to seven and a half years ago, January 3rd, 2016. A bunch of high school grads, local grads who uh, alumni had come back for college uh, for, for college for the uh, winter break. And they all survived New Year's Eve, which made us happy. 21 year old boys, reckless, wild. And uh, Christopher decided he was going to spend the last weekend with their friends up in a lake house in, in Lake Beulah, Wisconsin. And uh, and I was kind of relieved. I figured it'd be kind of a, a safe setting. You know, they're in this lake house. They're going to obviously kind of like their old man. They're going to, um, uh, you know, kick up their heels a little bit, have a little fun, but it was safe. You know, it wasn't in the streets of Chicago or anywhere else. And, on, you know, and as the Greeks say, man plans and gods laugh. And, uh, so they had gone up there, and uh, Christopher, I grew up in Buffalo, New York, and was a big Buffalo Bills football fan, and Christopher and I were going to watch the game the next day on television. And uh, and so I, I, you know, I started texting around 1030. Game starts at noon in the Midwest here, and I'm not getting anything back. And then I get a text from uh, the young man whose parents owned the, you know, owned the lake house, and said, Mr. McHugh, Chris and three of his friends are missing. You know, we haven't seen them since four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. So I grabbed the Labrador, jumped in the Jeep, threw in some hunting boots. And to be honest with you, I really figured I was going to find him with some pretty co-ed or at somebody else's house drinking off, uh, you know, the last vestiges of their party. Um, and, and and then while driving up, I got a call from the uncle who lived in the area and said, Mr. Quillen, it's no longer a search, but a recovery. All four boys had drowned. And uh, <clears throat> you go black as anybody who's experienced loss and uh, kind of in shock. Uh, I completed my drive and, and got up there and parents were in corners crying. Kids who were there, but a dozen of these kids staying there. They kicked up their heels at a local pub and then went back there to finish the celebration and get up in the morning and go home and get back to college and and at three o'clock in the morning, Chris and three friends went out on a lark and went out in the backyard and there was a boathouse and opened it up and four boys jumped in a three-man canoe. Um, you know, 21-year-old bravado, uh, layered clothing, unlaced Timberland boots, snoot full of alcohol. They paddled out. None of them made it back. So while, while, while driving up, uh, you know, I was trying to figure out 
what what happens now 15 years before this and i thought it was on a lark i had seen a a medium and and most of the reading was very mundane didn't didn't much didn't have a whole lot of connection but at the very end she said your dad is here and he said to tell your railroad and he's holding a caboose now my old man spent 40 years on the railroad all five boys we had 10 kids in the family all five boys worked on the railroad during college I stayed on as a brakeman later, you know, for a little while after. We were a railroad family. Behind me is a railroad lantern on my on my dresser, on my bookcase. So when she said that, that was astounding to me because it was flat out accurate. Now the old man didn't give me any tips about the universe or 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 anything. He just let me know that he was there and accessible, and he wasn't a verbose guy, so not talking a lot wasn't a surprise. So while approaching the, the, the lake house, I thought, wait a minute. If my dad is somewhere and my son is there, then he's going to be with him. I just need to figure this out. And that really did start my journey. Um, you know, I got up there and had to do all the horrible things of identifying. And talking to you right now, I can look out the window and I can see in my eye the picture window with the rescue boats on the lake and 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 sirens and police and and uh you know i i i i did what i had to do and then there were all the arrangements you know all the arrangements of uh, when i got home first of all telling you know calling my wife from up there calling his godmother who's in heaven with him now um her telling my kids calling you know calling his his godfather who was my best pal at the time and explaining this. And then I knew that the next week was full of unbelievable uh, tasks, you know, masses and, and funeral parlors and, and gravestones and receptions and, and, you know, all the things that go with this, uh, a tragedy that comes out of nowhere, comes out of the blue. And each night I'd get in bed, I, before I go to bed, exhausted because I was running from dusk to dawn from dawn to dusk. And I get on my knees. Now I'm 37 years sober. You know, I was a bit of a wild man. So when people say, gee, what were those boys doing in a canoe? You know, half in the bag. I knew exactly what they're doing because I would have done the exact same thing. You know, you never play out the end when you're in that reckless mode. So at, at night I get on my knees after accomplishing a bunch that day with an absolute broken heart. And I do what I do every night. I, I get on my knees and I thank God for my family and my sobriety. But I said, you know, we're not good yet. We're not good, you and me. You took my kid. This went on for three nights. And the third night, I collapsed into bed after my, my, my conversation with God. And I got a feedback that said, I didn't take your son. His recklessness and self-will caused him to come home. But I welcomed him. And remember, I lost a son too. So it was at that moment that I knew that Christopher had gone into an environment that was special, that he was loved, and that God wasn't somebody who moves us around like chess pieces. You know, he was, I wasn't paying for past sins. This wasn't a test. You know, Christopher, like me and like everybody here, was given free will. And that resulted in him transitioning, crossing over. I try not to say die because... I don't believe we die. I know we don't die. It's not belief, you know, that, you know, we're all energy and energy can't be destroyed. And what happens next, you know? So I knew that I needed some work to do because I wasn't ready to face a world without my son. And so, and I also figured I'm going to take this as far as I could go. That if I get to this and I find out that it's all hokey new age BS, and I'll cross it off the list and I'll figure something else to handle my grief. So I called that medium from 16 years before and she relocated to Arizona. And very early on, she contacted Christopher and he described what, what his death was like. She told me things that I didn't know until I got the coroner's report back. So it started sinking in that maybe this is real. I saw her or talked to her a couple times, and then I got greedy. I wanted to look into the face of somebody who was talking to my son directly. 
So there's a guy named Bob Olson wrote a wonderful book. He was an investigator in LA about the other side. And he was actually trying to disprove it and ended up being a convert. And it's a wonderful book. Look up Bob Olson. And unbeknownst to me, he also did a, a chart for mediums. So I reached out to a medium that was in the area, not far from me, who had highly rated, worked with police departments. And this was six months in. And, uh, you know, six months of, of really sleepwalking. Um, and I made an appointment to see him. The only thing he gave him was my cell number and my first name. So the day I'm going to go visit him and, uh, and, and see what's going on, uh, I did two things. I had stopped and picked up a, uh, a bracelet that Christopher had given me when we were in Disney World when he was about four or five years old, a leather bracelet, and I slipped it on under my cuff. I'd also stopped and I picked up some shamrock sheets. I had them delivered from Amazon. Now, what happened was, this might tell you a little bit of who you're listening to, <laughs> is that um, when Christopher, we buried Christopher on January um, 8th, 2016, um, we, we buried him in the North Shore of Chicago, the North Suburbs, um, cold, winter, rainy, snowy. The ground was covered. We bought a number of graves. And uh, when the snow melted, they, I had seen that he had buried him right next to another couple named the Sheridans, a Dr. Sheridan, lovely fella. But I had gotten something that I do now when I get an instinct, I follow it, and I, that, that I should move him over. So I, I held my breath, stamped my feet, you know, went to the funeral director and ended up doing it for half price. <laughs> they moved him over one grave. And I'll occupy the grave that was his. He's in the middle and my wife will be on the outside. And it's perfect. I followed the breadcrumbs. I listened to that higher voice and I moved him over. And, I, and seven years later, I'm so grateful that I did that. So, but at this time, they couldn't do that until the ground had softened. So we moved him over and, 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 and put this beautiful headstone. And I had planted these shamrock seeds around the grave. And the shamrocks to this day come up. And because the dirt was loose, and uh, and I was very happy with that 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 accomplishment. And I went out and saw this medium. And obviously, you know, there's a reason that I don't look like the type of guy that would sit here burning sage and candles and a crystal. And the reason I think is that what ma what makes me a good ambassador because I don't seem like somebody who would do that. And that's but that's what I do. So I went and saw this medium, Andrew, who turns out we're, we've become very close friends. And I walked in and he said, your son's here. He said, he's acknowledging that the family uh, was together on the other side, celebrating something with you and your wife. It was our anniversary, which of course we didn't celebrate six months after we lost our oldest. So, uh, and he said, Christopher's acknowledging that event. He's acknowledging that you wore the bracelet he gave you, and he's acknowledging that you planted something at his grave. Now, you got to understand, nobody knew I had shamrock seeds. I wasn't hiding the shamrocks from my lovely Protestant wife. <laughs> they just got in. Nobody knew that I was wearing this bracelet that I purposely had under my cuff. But in any of these situations, any of these events, there's an aha moment, right, when it clicked, and that was it. That was the moment I went from believing to knowing. I no longer believed that Christopher was on the other side with my family and God. I now knew it. I've subsequently probably seen a dozen mediums, and rarely has there been a swing and a miss. There was probably one that was pretty close, and the truth of the matter is, I didn't like the woman. Very famous medium and author. I didn't like her much. I didn't think my son might either, you know. So on the first anniversary of his uh, crossing over, now you know, every visit, everything that I, I was cataloging and writing and putting in and stapling and putting in, in, a, in, a, in a folder under date. So on the anniversary of his crossing, I had started that year getting up and coming into this room, which was his bedroom, which is now a, uh, 
which is now my office, my home office. And I started meditating, listening to guided meditation, burning sage, and just feeling them around me. And on the anniversary, January 3rd, 2017, I went through my routine and all of a sudden I started getting feedback, like somebody transcribed, you know, talking in your head. And at first I thought maybe I left the reservation and they were going to have to get a net. Uh, and then I just grabbed a pen and a legal pad, just like this, and wrote down everything he told me. And now why I knew that wasn't me doing this to put a salve on this broken heart, this wound, was because he said, Dad, you got to let go of the resentment. I love Scotty. He loved me. He was a chum. He was my pal. It wasn't his fault. Now, Scotty was the young man whose parents owned this lake house. They were a little loose with any supervision and, and kind of well off and, and, and maybe coddled their son and I had a resentment. I was mad. And I'm Irish. You know, they say that Irish Alzheimer's was you forget everything but the grudges, you know. So I wanted to hold on to that resentment. Um, and he told me I couldn't. And I thought, okay, Chris, anything for you. Besides, folks, when am I going to see this kid again, right? Six months after, you know, I'm, I never want to see this kid again. So that that day was the anniversary. My wife and I were going to meet at the grave around sundown, do a Chinese lantern, and, and just honor our boy. And, of course, I stayed home from work and, and, and you know, just doing the things you do. And I got a call from some of his fraternity buddies who were still in our lives, um, the college pals. And they were more from a blue-collar background like I was. And I really love them. And they were such good friends and they still are. We attend their weddings. They're, you know, they're, they're children. They have, a, they have a birthday celebration and they raise money for charity every year on Christopher's birthday. So I get a text from the buddy and say, Mr. McHugh, a few of us are going to meet at his grave at 3.30. Can you make it? So I grabbed the hockey cooler, threw some Gatorade and beer and grabbed a box of cigars and figured I would just hang out with four or five of his buddies and, and honor their friend, my son. And I pull up into Sacred Heart Cemetery, which is a fabulous cemetery. It's open 24 hours a day. And I pull into it, and there were literally 40 cars. There were cars that were filled. The whole parking lot was filled. And I looked at the grave, and there was probably 40 kids there waiting, all, all there just to celebrate my son. And, uh, and the first kid I saw was Scotty. So he was preparing me for this moment. When I wasn't going in there resentful, when I wasn't going in there angry, I could embrace him and tell him the truth, that it wasn't his fault. It could have been anybody's house. It could have been my house. Those visits continue to this day, you know, two or three times a month. I had a visit at 3, 326 this morning from him and, and wrote down. And the first year was all about where he's at, describing the other side, describing the colors. He would say, you know, you wouldn't believe the colors. They're blue and green and, and gorgeous. And the airs love air. It's never cold here. It's always warm. And describe what they do, you know. And I just thought it was amazing. And then the following years has been more about sharing messages with parents who've lost kids. You know, it, 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 what, what, what finally came to fruition was there's a wonderful book and a movie called The Shack, where a guy lost a daughter in a horrible way. And he met God, you know, in a shack. And God said, just because I work incredible good out of unspeakable tragedies, doesn't mean I orchestrate the tragedies. And it, and it dawned on me that I had work to do. You know, Chris said, Dad, you'll be a good ambassador. People will hear it from you because, you know, people believe what you tell them. 